Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sunshine Menezes, and I'm Executive Director of Metcalf Institute. I am very excited to welcome you to today's Climate Change and the News webinar. This is an ongoing series that features uh, experts in science and um, journalism and uh, more broadly in communication um, to talk about issues that are relevant and timely in the news. Uh, today, we are very excited to offer a um, two presentations actually related to an interesting suite of surveys and training opportunities and resources as well for journalists. Um, so the first speaker today will be Dr. Ed Maybach. Dr. Maybach is a public health and science communication expert. Um, he's the director of the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University. He studies public understanding of and engagement in climate change and he develops and evaluates approaches for enhancing public understanding and public engagement on those topics. He previously served as a member of the National Climate Assessment Develop and Advisory Committee um, that produced the third National Climate Assessment. He also co-chaired the committee's Engagement and Communication Working Group. In 2018, Dr. Maybach was appointed a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Then our second speaker will be uh, Sean Sublett, who is an award-winning meteorologist working with Climate Central on the Climate Matters program. He brings 19 years of experience as a broadcast meteorologist to that role. Before joining Climate Central, he was chief meteorologist at WSET in Lynchburg, Virginia, and morning meteorologist at WSLS in Roanoke uh, prior to that. Um, before his promotion to Chief Meteorologist in Lynchburg, the Virginia Association of Broadcasters awarded his team Best Morning Show six times in eight years. He is also or was also an adjunct professor at Lynchburg College, and he briefly worked as a contractor at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center before that. He has served on the American Meteorological Society's Distinguished Science Journalism Award Committee and has been a script reviewer for the American Institute of Physics discoveries and breakthroughs in science. He holds the AMS, American Meteorological Society's Certified Broadcast Meteorologist seal and was a member of the AMS Board of Broadcast Meteorology from 2006 through 2009, serving as board chair in 2009. Okay, do you see my screen now? We do and we can hear you. Fantastic, so thank you Sunshine and, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, because we only have a few minutes together, I'm going to keep my points to only three. Um, the first one of which is the fact that um, most Americans do understand that our climate is changing. So this this notion that we have of two Americas, where half of us are um, are on board with the science and half of us are are actively resisting uh, the accepting the reality, it's just not really the case. Um, most Americans do accept that climate change is happening, although as recently as a few years ago, really as recently as, as now still, but certainly a few years ago, most of us tended to misunderstand when, where, and what is being harmed by climate change. Um, although the good news to this statement is it, it's beginning to change. In the survey that we released last week, um, we saw a real palpable shift in, in that belief. But coming back to this, this misperception, so it, it probably doesn't surprise any of you that, that most, uh, to, to learn that most Americans see climate change as a distant threat, not today's threat. Um, so when, you know, when we ask people, well, when do you think um, Americans will be harmed by climate change, the answers we get depend on who we ask, but generally speaking, the answers we get are many decades, if, if not all the way up to the end of this century. Um, in reality, as, as we know from the National Climate Assessment, climate change has already come home to roost in, already come home to roost in many communities across America. The other way in which people tend to misperceive, Americans tend to misperceive climate change is they see it as a, a distant threat from us geographically. So not in Boston, maybe Bangladesh, um, which is not terrible, which is one thing, it's not true. It's actually climate change has come home to roost in Boston um, as well as Bangladesh. But when people only see it as distant from us geographically, they don't understand. And when they don't understand that they and theirs, are being affected by it or could be affected by it, it tends to create a, a rather gaping psychological distance. Um, and then the final way in which people misperceive, tend to misperceive climate change is that it's, 
It's only a problem for plants, penguins, and polar bears, not for people. Um, the reason why that is problematic is only a third of Americans see themselves as environmentalists. About two thirds of us have reasonably strong environmental values, um, but only one third consider ourselves environmentalists and, and the other third with strong environmental values really don't want to be seen or mistaken for an environmentalist because many Americans actually hold environmentalists in uh, not in high regard. So there's a real social distance between us and um, and the issue when we see the issue is primarily affecting plants, penguins, and polar bears. So this is actually data from our survey about nine months ago. To, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I changed the slide at the last moment. This is our most recent survey, so uh, uh, data. Survey conducted just last month. Um, what I said, you can see the reality of what I said is you move across the slide from the left to the right, you can see that 22% uh, of Americans think that global warming will harm them personally. On the right-hand side, you can see that 59% of Americans believe that future generations of, um, um, uh, of people will be harmed by global warming a great deal. So you still see this distance that I talked about. Um, but even if you look at the, the left-hand side of the slide, how the degree to which people feel that they personally, their family member, or people in their community will be harmed by climate change, for the first time ever, we've really gotten to the halfway mark. So half of Americans now understand that they, their family members, and, and people in their community will be harmed at least a moderate amount by global warming. And that really has changed dramatically over the past five years. We, we ask this question, or these questions, excuse me, every six months, and we have done so for the past 11 years. Over the past five years, we've seen a 15, um, and in some cases, 18 percentage point increase in these measures of feeling personally affected or having your family member threatened by global warming. So there's a big shift going on. That shift is consistent with what we learned from the National Climate Assessment, but nevertheless, people still tend to believe that thing, people and things far away from them are more likely to be hurt than themselves. Um, again, consistent with what I've just said, this simply shows the, the overtime um, trend in the proportion of Americans who believe that people in the United States are being harmed right now by global warming. So in, in January of 2010, it was a quarter of us. In December of 2018, it's half of us. Um, a doubling of the rate at which people recognize that Americans are indeed being harmed by global warming, that's a really profound shift in public understanding in the span of eight years. So the second point I want to make is that um, America is a big, diverse place. People in some communities are different than people in other communities. Um, everything that I've shown you, you can learn for yourself on the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. If you think of your audience as being largely defined geographically, so if you write for or write or present to a news audience in a given community or in a given state or, or even in a given region, you can look, you can go to the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. My colleagues at Yale have taken this polling work we do with them and they've downscaled it to the municipal level, to the congressional district level, to, and to the state level so that you can learn exactly what people are thinking, feeling, and supporting with regard to climate solutions. So I'll, I'll just walk you through a few of those um, images right now to give you a sense of what you can find on the Yale Climate Opinion maps. The most current data from those maps is uh, 2018 data. They probably won't update it with 2019 data until later in this year, but but, and although I've said to you, Americans are changing their views about climate change, not changing so fast that 2018 data is in any way, shape, or form out of date. So I, I focus on Florida here for a moment. Um, this, is, this is the map that shows at the county level the degree to which Floridians believe that global warming is happening. You can see that, by, that in virtually every county in, in Florida, the majority believe it's happening in some counties more than in other counties. Um, you can see that in most, but not all counties in Florida, the um, Floridians believe that global warming is mostly caused by human activities. And you can see that most, but not all Floridians, in, in most, but not all counties in Florida, um, 
Floridians are worried about global warming, at least a, a majority, a slim majority are worried about global warming. The, the panhandle is, uh, is the one place where you see a bit of a divergence on that trend. Miami, on the other hand, is a place where you see higher than average levels of concern. Um, we have a whole battery of different policy support questions. Um, it's, it's helpful when people understand what their risks are, when they understand that, in fact, their local area is at risk from climate change. It's even more helpful when we understand what sorts of solutions that they would like to see enacted. Um, collective level solutions, not much more so than individual level solutions, because collective solutions are what is really required here. So. Um, Support for regulating CO2 as a pollutant, very strong support for that. Um, in the prior slides, support for a carbon tax, also surprisingly strong support for that. Um, and then here's where the rubber meets the road with regard to you all. Um, in Florida, and you can see in all of the surrounding states, um, most Americans say they hear about global warming in the media relatively infrequently. I don't pur purport that to be a uh, an active, uh, an accurate assessment of how frequently the issue is featured in the media, but people feel that they are not hearing about it in the media very frequently. Um, others have said that uh, uh, other research actually doing content analysis of what is in the media does show a surprisingly low level of coverage of this issue, um, both in the national media, but particularly in local media, which takes me to my third and final point. So. We, uh, Sean Sublett will be talking in a moment about the Climate Matters Project that, uh, that Climate Central and George Mason and NOAA and NASA and AMS and others have been partnered on for the past eight years. Um, we've learned a lot about local reporting in that eight years, and, and this is really the most important point I want to make. With regard to reporting locally on climate change, um, there is really nothing to fear but fear itself. Your audience members are going to be are really interested in learning about the local implications of climate change. They tend to hear about it as a national issue or an international issue, and they tend to hear very little about it in the media as a local issue. To try to find ways that we could help local reporters um, by providing them with localized climate reporting materials. About a year ago, we surveyed the members of RTDNA and um, NABJ, NAHJ, and Society for Environmental Journalists um, to learn the members of those societies' interest in local climate reporting and learn what the barriers, their barriers were to doing so. Um, we, from, from those surveys, we've, we learned that there are a, is a lot of interest in reporting local climate stories. Um, these are the, the top stories of interest, uh, drought and, and water impacts, impacts on human health, impacts on extreme precipitation, air quality, extreme heat events, etc. So there is no shortage in topics that, that people who report locally would like to cover. Um, but more importantly, and again, where the rubber meets the road with regard to your business, um, we found that there are a lot of obstacles to reporting on climate change as a from a local perspective. Um, obstacle number one is simply lack of time to do the field reporting. Obstacle number two was lack of, of training, lack of experience in, in climate science. Um, and I'm going to jump down to, because there's nothing I can, we can do about obstacle number three, lack of time and space in the news hole, but, lack, but obstacle number four was lack of access to role models for climate reporting. So I'm going to end my comments here, turn it over to Sean, while I'm doing that, um, because uh, Sean will be addressing uh, some what we have done, excuse me, um, what we are trying to do with, uh, with our Climate Matters Project to try to address some of those obstacles to make local climate reporting more feasible for any journalist who would like to do so. Uh, my name is Sean Sublett. I'm a broadcast, former broadcast meteorologist, uh, now working for uh, Climate Central here in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, my colleague Bernadette sends her regards. Uh, sorry she couldn't be here. She was feeling a bit under the weather uh, after quite a cross-country trip talking to the folks uh, at our board here uh, at Climate Central in California. So a little bit about what Climate Matters uh, is about and Climate Matters in the newsroom. At its core, Climate Matters in the newsroom is a free, and that's the important part, it's free. It's not something you have to pay for. 
It's a science-based and mostly localized climate change reporting resource. For journalists, when we talk about climate matters in the newsroom, and we, this is kind of an offshoot of our original Climate Matters program by itself, which was more uh, focused toward weathercasters, broadcast meteorologists, such as myself. I like to kid around that uh, before I became in sales, I was a client. I was a subscriber uh, to Climate Matters uh, back in the day before I came to Climate Central about four years ago. So how do we do this? We, we gather our resources and focus on the science and we put together our resources at a local level whenever possible. Then, invariably, there are going to be the occasional subjects in climate science that aren't necessarily localizable, but more often than not, that is the goal we set so that we can take this information and make it pertinent, make it valuable, and make it relevant to the localized audience. We try to keep it simple and compelling and also work on the current news cycle. Whatever is kind of the broad conversation at the time, we try to mirror that as much as possible. Again, this is free to journalists and meteorologists. We'll talk about how to get on board uh, with the program here uh, in just a couple of minutes. So the Climate Matters is weekly, more aimed at television meteorologists with a weather focus. The Climate Matters in the newsroom comes out monthly. It's a little more targeted toward journalists and has additional resources for going out and doing the reporting. The meteorological focus often is a 10 or 15 second kind of drop in for people doing TV weather. For journalists, it's more of the longer form uh, topics. Here's one example we had from uh, last summer where we looked at the, the number of days that was suitable for mosquitoes uh, to thrive in several cities, or 244 cities uh, across the country. This was San Francisco. These comment matters in the newsroom will come with some kind of data nugget. We'll send a bunch of key points there is a narrative, there are interview opportunities, and within all of this, you get a few more bullet points that contain uh, more information if you want to go further with the topic. And we also have a few stock images um, from Creative Commons if you're doing something that's exclusively online. Another example of this was last fall uh, in a concert with Veterans Day. We did something called Under Fire, where we look at specifically how climate change was impacting America's military bases whether it was Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, and how, what, kind of, what kind of challenges climate change is posing for the military. Again, we have a couple of people who have agreed to do interviews. That sometimes they're affiliated with us, sometimes they're not, but they have agreed uh, to field your comments uh, whenever possible. Again, we have a brief narrative. We have a couple of data points to share uh, in addition to the Creative Commons images uh, to put along as well. Now, in, a, in addition to the Climate Matters in the newsroom, if you sign up for this as a journalist, you will still get our weekly Climate Matters because there is a lot of value in that as well, not just for the hot times of year. These are a few of our releases that have come out just within the past three months. What came out today we, at the top left, that's less extreme cold, where we looked at the individual lowest temperature recorded every year over the past 50 years uh, with the big Arctic outbreak that's going on right now in the upper Midwest. We can look at something like what's the average winter temperature through December, January, and February. We see that's going up in Providence. We have something like um, what's just the December warming trend. We look at Providence, Rhode Island here, uh, and the Christmas extremes. Uh, so what's the warmest Christmas? What's the coldest Christmas? What was the snowiest one? Uh, and then we can look at individual seasons. In Rhode Island, for example, winter uh, is the fastest warming season. We also look at things that have more impact uh, results such as hurricanes and climate change, uh, warmer water means more fuel and heavier rain and higher storm surge. We can look at the incidence of, of flooding past, present, and future uh, as sea level rise continues to become more of an issue, especially in the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts. And we look at things like just the number of hot days, the number of hot days that are above a specific climatological threshold. Like in Miami, it might be 90 degrees that we consider a hot day. In Phoenix, it might be 100. In uh, Minneapolis, it might be 80. So we, we look at figures like that. And then more on the impact-based things, which I think are more targeted toward newsroom, we can look at something called smoke wave days. In other words, the number of days per year with a certain concentration of smoke. Because wildfires are an issue uh, in the West United States. A lot of places, the poison ivy and uh, mosquitoes, they're all going to be issues as well. As you can see, our bottom two graphics there uh, indicate our releases that come out in Spanish. 
and there are also some more lighthearted ones like the, the impact of climate change on, the, on local economies that have uh, microbreweries. We also look at how trees are helping take carbon out of the atmosphere in different amounts of in different parts of the country and things like football season. What, what cities are warming at what rates during their traditional football season. For example, Philadelphia there in the top left, we look at the overall September, October, November, December time frame. How is that period warm? Then at the top right, you see renewable electricity growth. We're, we're starting to look at more solutions-oriented kind of topics because, as uh, Ed showed you there, solutions are wildly popular across uh, political ideologies. People in, in want to know about solutions, uh, and, and they're much more, uh, much more willing to listen to you when you talk about solutions uh, versus causes. Fair enough. And one of those solutions is our, our wind and solar electricity uh, generation tool. Basically, you, you can go to our website, and we'll, we'll have this at the end of the program, um, where you can just pull down a market, and we'll tell you how much solar electricity, how much wind electricity uh, can be generated uh, in that market, given the weather conditions of that day. So we can figure out how much uh, solar electricity is generated, uh, how many homes that will power in a specific market, and, and how much that would save uh, the typical residents if they had solar panels uh, on their home. How much would that save you in your daily cost uh, of electricity? You can see there for Phoenix, which is what I pulled up today, that percentage is actually over 100, which means if you had the connections just right, you could actually return energy or electricity onto the grid. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the videos working as well as we would like, but we had one of our meteorologists in our program in Peoria, Illinois, uh, discuss this very topic about um, the renewable energy generated um, for the weather in this curtain uh, on any given day, and that was uh, at the NBC affiliate in uh, Peoria, Illinois. I I'm going to post these stories at our Climate Matters in the Newsroom Facebook page. You can send me an email at the end of the presentation. I'll, send my, I'll have my email address up, uh, and we will get you on board so you can see some of these things in action. Now, before you even sign up, if you want to learn more about what we're offering, you can go to our media library there, medialibrary.climatecentral.org, and you can search for what we've already done there in the box by using a keyword, pull down your market, or, or a specific topic, and that will return some results about some topics that are more germane to your particular area. There are also additional resources beyond these weekly things that we put out. Um, we, have a, we host a series of webinars ourselves on particular topics. We do occasional research reports on a broader topic. One that came out a couple of weeks ago with Climate Matters in the newsroom really looked at the effect of warming winters on winter recreation and winter economies. We still have a few older interactives that are, that are um, very useful. And we have a climate change PowerPoint presentation. This is a turnkey uh, PowerPoint presentation on the basic science of climate change uh, if you were to do, ever do any kind of public outreach. So to get Climate Matters, you could sign up there on the website, medialibrary.climatecentral.org, or go there um, and just click on the link and go through that way, or you could always do something as easy as, as send me an email. Um, when we have specific weather effects uh, or weather high-impact weather events going on, whether it's a flood or a drought, a heat wave, severe weather outbreak, hurricanes, or wildfires, we've collected a lot of our uh, resources in these kind of toolkits. So if you're covering a wildfire, you can go to our Extreme Weather Toolkit, click on wildfires, and give you a quick rundown of all of our wildfire information. Similar thing when the summer comes around, if you're going through a heat wave, our Extreme Heat Toolkit will have all of our resources cobbled together uh, to talk about that. So there's the, the eight topics you see on the screen uh, that are all covered, from heavy rain and flooding uh, to decreases in snow and ice to the severe weather. Uh, additionally, away from the Immediate Climate Matters program, other side of the office here, we have a very dedicated group of scientists working on sea level rise information. Uh, our sea level rise team puts together this interactive, which will tell you, and again, this is for those of you in coastal markets, what different amounts of sea level rise up to 10 feet are going to do in your local community in terms of affecting infrastructure, school, let's see, roads, rail lines, factories, recreational centers. Uh, housing communities. Uh, different amounts of sea level rise um, will affect those communities in different ways, and you can go through it and, and see how that's going to affect uh, those communities. Some upcoming topics we've got uh, in the works for our, our Climate Matters in the newsroom. 
We're going to be looking at uh, shifting agricultural zones, how you might have been able to grow one crop very well in one part of the country, and that zone is now shifting farther to the north. Something called localized impacts, and, and, and these are going to be a, a broader series of impacts of anything from health to food supply, water scarcity, uh, infrastructure inland, and the economy. I mean, jobs and productivity, uh, water supply, water quality, uh, fisheries, hunting, uh, the price of food, uh, air pollution, vector-borne diseases, all those things into the uh, localized impacts. Of course, anytime there is extreme weather popping up, uh, if you've got sporting events or a recurring annual event uh, in your market area, it's a good time to talk about that. I can't emphasize enough, the positive stories are, are ones that really take hold and resonate uh, with viewers. One of the things that our research has done, and I'm sure Ed has, has seen this as well, is that when you talk about renewable energy and you talk about solutions, those have very high positive feedback from audiences because uh, there's a widespread support for renewable energy, uh, and that's something that, frankly, we like to see. We do not, we're not as an organization into us necessarily supporting a particular solution over another one, but we do like to have all those kind of out on the table uh, for everyone to see. And with that, I think I will pause uh, and uh, stop sharing my screen and turn this back over to, to Sunshine. And, and I know I and, and, and uh, Ed are happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sean and Ed. That was a fantastic summary of all the work that you're doing and a really phenomenal suite of resources uh, for journalists and anyone who's interested in learning more about climate change. Um, so the questions are starting to come in. Um, definitely a lot of people are excited about everything that you have to offer. Uh, one of the first questions actually is about whether um, you make any of these resources available for people outside of the U.S. You realize you've got plenty on your hands with the continental U.S., um, but there was a question from someone in Canada actually just wondering uh, if you have plans for expanding uh, the resources beyond this area. Sure, I'll jump in with that, Ed. If you need to follow up, let me know. Uh, almost everything right now is domestic because that's where the data is most available. Um, We've had a couple of people in Vancouver and Toronto uh, ask us to do very similar things, but it's very hard um, to get the information from Environment Canada. Uh, so w we hear you, and that's something we are looking into with our with our data analyst staff here. Um, so that's kind of one of the grand designs. It's on the horizon, but it's not something that's going to be happening awfully soon. But we hear you. It's something we would absolutely like to do uh, for other parts of the world. Great. Well, and so now coming back to the U.S., um, the, the, um, the availability of these regionally focused um, resources is obviously just a fantastic contribution. How often do you provide those um, kind of like updated new resources uh, with a regional focus? Yeah, so that kind of goes in with, with the climate matters every week. And now that we've been doing this several years, every couple of years, we will go back and kind of update and analysis. Let's say that oh, we know that the winters have been warming in a certain part of the country about four degrees over the past 40 or 50 years uh, through 2017. Well, maybe it's time to do an update because we've gone through another entire year of data. So we, we pick a new topic every week for our 244 cities across the United States where we try to do these local analysis. And we try to pick a topic that is going to be relevant to kind of what's going on in the general news cycle. So those come every week, and then those regular uh, climate matters in the newsroom focuses uh, come out once a month. Great. Um, another question is about, uh, is logistical in nature. So someone asks, where can they get, um, or how can they access those public opinion maps that Ed referenced, um, the Yale climate opinion maps? Uh, just type Yale Climate Opinion Maps into your uh, browser, and it will take you right there. They're online. Easy. Easy. Got it. And, I, you know, I have another question about that, Ed, kind of related. Um, so I think that the, the surveys that you all did about uh, how journalists are, um, what they need, what their obstacles are for reporting on climate change were just really insightful. And, of course, Metcalf Institute does training for journalists all the time, so we really valued the information that came out of that. Um, I wonder if you can talk at all about um, some of the ways that local reporting on climate change affects kind of broader public opinion. Is it something that you can comment on? 
Yeah, so actually we, we are hard at work trying to evaluate the impact of the first six years of the Climate Matters Program, which until this past summer was entirely focused on supporting TV weather captures, but now we're, we're trying to broaden it, as Sean said, and providing materials for a broader set of journalists. So the question, it creates the fact that we do these surveys every six months creates the opportunity to, to test the question. In communities where we're getting more local climate change reporting, are we seeing a faster uptick in those, those indicators of public opinion that I shared with you a moment ago? And we, we still don't really have a definitive answer to that yet, but, but we do have a couple of sort of small, um, we have, we've done a couple of evaluation studies that were more modest in scope. For example, uh, our very first pilot test was in Columbia, South Carolina with Jim Gandy, the chief meteorologist at the CBS affiliate there. And um, we surveyed local news viewers both before Jim uh, worked with us for a year and at the end of the year. And what we learned is that in Jim ran 13 stories over the course of a year on air. And um, our survey showed that Jim's viewers, the CBS affiliates viewers, learned more about climate change and local relevance over the course of the year than did viewers of the competing stations. That was way back in 2010, 2011. So this is ancient history, but nevertheless, it really, it, it convinced us that there's real merit in trying to help local journalists tell, tell local climate stories because A, it allowed, in this case, it allowed Jim to tell those stories and, and B, our impact evaluation showed that it made a difference. We since replicated impact evaluations in Miami and in Chicago on a, sort of a more limited scale. And we, in both of those cities, we showed that the, the work of uh, the reporting by broadcast meteorologists made a difference in helping people in those cities understand the local relevance of the issue. And, and we're hoping that our the impact of the national impact evaluation that I talked about will in fact demonstrate that that when reporters are using these materials that we're helping uh, them, that we're providing, that it really does um, increase this, 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 what I'm calling a secular trend, this dawning understanding that climate change isn't just a future threat or, or uh, somebody else's threat any longer. Thanks. Um, that's great. Well, we look forward to seeing the results of, of those, um, those additional studies you're doing. Um, another person just asked about um, basically resources related to um, the evolving understanding of how climate change is affecting the polar vortex. Um, so are, is this something that you have resources readily available for, or are you working on them? All right, I'll speak to that one. Uh, the, the issue with that, and I'll tell you what, uh, Sunshine, if, if I may, can I share my screen and get, uh, course, get, course. My, um, get the information back up there uh, so everybody can get the, the email and the website and, and all that? Uh, once again, there we go. Um, yeah, you can text Climate Matters to that number there. The media library address is there. Or you can email me directly or my colleague, Bernard Placking. I'll, I'll leave those up there for a bit while we talk about the polar vortex. Um, there is, we, we, we don't have specific resources about that right now. The reason for that is because the science is still out about this particular uh, type of event. There, there's growing consensus. It's not quite as far along as, as I think a lot of people uh, are comfortable with, but there's growing consensus that as you have a warming Arctic, that that's going to kind of make the polar vortex or the, the true polar vortex or that spinning mass of cold air that's over top of the North Pole. Uh, as that warms, it tends to break up a little bit more. And as it breaks up a little bit more, chunks of that very cold air begin to slide down southward toward the middle latitudes where most of us live. Um, there is very much a physical reason behind that. Uh, it's trying to connect the statistical dots. It's still something that needs to be done. Um, so there's good evidence. It's not all the way there yet, uh, but there is certainly evidence to suggest what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Uh, the warming Arctic affects the polar uh, the, the polar vortex, the polar jet stream, if you will, makes it more up and down or, or meridional, as we like to say. And that will, in turn, send more cold breaks down uh, toward the United States, lower North America. Having said that, though, if you do have the, the entire Arctic warming, which it is, 
the intensity of that cold air because it has to come from someplace. When it gets 20 degrees below in Chicago, that cold air has to come from someplace. That's what we call the source area. So if the Arctic is also warming, the source of that cold air is also warming. So that's why even if you have these polar outbreaks, they are not going to be as intense as what we have seen 40, 50, 60 plus years ago because the Arctic itself, that source region for all that cold air is also warming. Right. So, by the way, there's an absolutely phenomenal visualization of the polar vortex on today's uh, New York Times website. It's just mind blowing. Yeah, I completely agree. I saw that too. It is beautiful, uh, just a beautiful visualization. I'll also note that uh, Metcalf Institute has um, on our YouTube channel, which is where this webinar will be posted later, um, we have a previous webinar by Dr. Jennifer Francis, who has been studying the polar vortex and its relationship with climate change for, for a while. Um, she's one of the leaders in that, in that area. Um, a very popular webinar that talks about a lot of the um, mechanisms that Sean just described. So if you want to go back and um, see a, a more detailed piece about that, please check out that webinar. Um, so uh, another question, and, and I know one of you said this, but I just want to be sure everyone gets it. Um, there is an opportunity for people to sign up to get notified about new Climate Matters resources. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I mean, once you, once you sign on to the program, that will effectively get you, get you on the list to get the new resources, yes. And that's just from the website? That's correct. You can go to the website and, and sign up there, or you can you know, send an email me directly because I'm one of the people that kind of monitors the, the list of, of people that we send out to. So um, either way is fine, whatever works for the individual. Wonderful. Um, well, I, I would be remiss in not noting since um, lack of training for journalists on climate science is one of the major obstacles uh, that you identified in, in your surveys, that Metcalf Institute, of course, offers uh, training, and we also have a, a week-long science immersion workshop for journalists. There's a, an open call for applications. The deadline is February 18th, so anyone who's on this webinar and interested in applying for that, please get your application in soon. We talk about climate change and global change and what this means this year. We'll be focusing on what this means for water resources specifically. Um, so uh, Sean and Ed, I'll give either of you, both of you, the opportunity to make a last comment if you have anything before we sign off. Okay, Ed, I'll go, I'll go real quick and then let you finish up, sir. Um, you know, this whole climate matters in the newsroom, the, the point of this was to, to take climate change away from, I don't mean away from meteorologists, uh, but to make it more than just a weather story. In a lot of locations, the climate change story was just ceded to the weather folks. When we see the impacts taking hold in the local communities, that's why we wanted to reach out to the journalists so they could tell those impactful stories. And we do understand that time is limited, and that's also one of the key points to this program, is to help save you time, point you toward the resources you need. And so it's so hard to get interviews. We, we get that. That's why we want to give at least two, peop uh, two people, um, two interviewees, give you the names of two people to interview. And there is also a resource we haven't talked about called Sciline, S-C-I-L-I-N-E. Uh, and they will also help hook you up, hook journalists up with people who are very willing, uh, scientists who are very willing to talk to journalists about current research uh, that is impactful. So, I, again, the whole point of this is to help save you time, get you the resources you need uh, to put, put together the story the best that you can. Thanks, Sean. Ed? Yes, so my last point, I'd just like to reiterate the final point I made in my slides, which is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear, but fear itself. Um, in our, we take our survey data and we've done an audience segmentation analysis through that. We've identified what we call global warming six Americas. There really are six distinct Americas or Americans out there with regard to their views about climate change. Over the past five years, they have been um, the, the most concerned groups that we call the alarmed and the concerned have grown dramatically. Those two groups are now over half of Americans. And the only group that really has closed down their minds to the possibility of global warming, we call them the dismissive. They're now down at about 8% of America, um, which means that fewer, you know, if your community is like, uh, like an average American community, it means that fewer than 10% of your audience are are, are, aren't interested in learning what you might tell them about the relevance of climate change to their community. 
And yes, it means you're going to get some pushback in social media from those folks. I, I get it all the time. Um, but, it, but if you are letting your concern about that negative reinforcement from that 8% drive your influence, your you know, storytelling, you're really doing a disservice to the 92% of members of your community who really don't understand very well the, the, the local relevance of climate change and are eager to learn. So let, let's all... Let's all focus on the 92% who want to learn and not the 8% who, who are unwilling to learn. Great. Well said. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Um, Ed, we reali realize that you are um, in a winter wonderland down there, so glad that you were able to join us and that all of the technology cooperated. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining this webinar. Um, so we look forward to seeing you again another time. Thanks, Sean and Ed. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Sunshine.